Welcome, welcome, um, whether it is morning, afternoon, or if you are our guests, uh, evening for you. We are so happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Rabbi Becky Jay, and I am the program manager of Amor, the Institute for Bold Jewish Thought. I'm delighted to welcome you here today to, to, to continue our conversation with Small Emuni, Israel's faithful left. In addition to streaming the Zoom uh, uh, as a webinar, we're excited to be streaming on Facebook Live right now, if it's easier to find us that way. And as always, a recording will be provided to you after this webinar. EMOR, a project of TRUA, is a thought leadership institute where we use Jewish sources, old and new, to invigorate our commitment to human rights and propel us to action. Emor is committed to bringing together people from all corners of the Jewish community to ask big questions, study Jewish texts, old and new, and hold courageous conversations about today's most important moral and pressing issues. As we get things started here, I invite you to share in the chat where you are joining us from and one learning about small emuni that you are hoping to leave with at the end of this webinar. Today's webinar builds on a series that we held over the winter called The Threefold Chord, How Democracy, Nationalism, and Human Rights Fit Together in the Jewish State in the 21st Century. All of these recordings are available on our website, emorinstitute.org, under the Israel and Occupied Palestinian Territories page. Today's program is the continuation of a new three-part series during which we will explore a uniquely Israeli and Jewish response to the question of the threefold chord that was raised, the creation and rise of a movement, small emuni, in English known as the faithful left, and what it can do to create a new future. I am honored to have with us our guest teachers today, two leaders of small emuni, and two people who will tell us more about this movement and teach us about how we can support them and we can all support each other in doing so in sh by the movement that they are shepherding into being. I'd like to welcome back Michael Menaken, a longtime friend of Trua. He's the director of the Alliance Fellowship, and which is an, is an Arab Jewish political network in Israel. And before running the Alliance, he served as the director of Mulad, a nonpartisan progressive think tank in Jerusalem focused on democratic change in Israel. Prior to that, Mikhail was the executive director of Breaking the Silence. And in 2021, he published the book, At Halta, Ethics and Tradition in a Time of Power. The book is set out to come out in English later this year. We're all very excited, Mikhail. 
and he lives in Jerusalem with his wife and three children. And for the very first time, I'm very excited to welcome to our Zoom space, Panina Pfeiffer, a Jerusalemite and mother of two, and active in both municipal and national politics in, and initiatives. Growing up in an ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem from a young age, she felt a deep curiosity about different cultures and communities. Panina's life took her on a journey of education, marriage, work, and small children. Her life changed course after her divorce, and she opted to move to the mixed neighborhood of Nachlaot. As a believer that the Palestinian community of Jerusalem is key to the well-being of the city, Panina seeks to encourage coexistence and policy change. She serves on the Joint Israeli-Palestinian Board of 0202 and collaborates with Ir Amim and other organizations in the conflict resolution ecosystem. Panina also founded a Beit Midrash for ultra-Orthodox women, and she is currently the CEO at both Yad Levi Eshkol and the New Haredim an initiative to bring together policy-driven activists who seek social justice and progress for their community and beyond. We want to thank you both for taking the time to teach us this afternoon or evening. Um, and as always, we welcome questions in the chat. I apologize in advance if we are not able to get to all of them, um, but that is just the sign of a great conversation, which I know that we are going to have in this next hour or so. As the second installation in our series, the webinar will examine some of the social issues that bind the faithful left together as a movement with a strong following of diverse peoples and ideas, which we spoke about briefly in our last webinar. But before we get started speaking about the specific social and economic histories that have influenced the creation of small emuni, we'd like to briefly remind ourselves that its birth, its present, and its future rely on these people who are sitting before us here. Mikhail, in our last webinar, you mentioned Panina, and now I'm doing quotes. I actually went back and listened to this as quote, one of the most inspirational leaders and activists of the movement, end quote. I know, Panina, it's true. You can go back and listen as well. And one of the most inspirational leaders of our time. So we're so, so delighted to have you here. And with that, we would love to hear and learn a little bit more about how you would describe what Small Muni is and specifically your entrance into the movement as an integral partner. Okay, well, um, when Michael says um, I'm doing something, then I come. That's that's the short story. The long story is, um, I think I've known Michael for like, I don't know, eight years, seven years. We through different initiatives that we've done and collaborated on and whatever. And that's that's basically how the whole Smolim Muni conference and now movement came into being, it was basically um, people who are colleagues, friends, um, you know, and we were all very, very frustrated at the, over the political outcome in Israel, um, which is now a, a government and uh, our government. And um, and then Michael said, let's let's just get people together. You know, like if we feel like this, there must be other people who feel this way as well. And and let's just do it. And we thought it would be like this, you know, modest kind of gathering of like minded people. And um, but then not me. I'm not an overreacher. There were other people in the group who were like, let's let's overreach. Let's book like a a very large hall and be a very um like recognized um you know it's it's the it's the hall that's associated with the with the rabbinate in Israel and um the official rabbinate and the chief you know the chief rabbinate used to be reside in that building and so um and we were sure it wasn't gonna like at least some of us I was like every day every morning I would wake up I'm like when are they gonna cancel and when is but it it worked out. 
Um, so basically, we the the people who you know went in you know into the leadership of this conference and organized it were all we're, we're all working together like we, we see each other all the time and we organize things all the time and it's sort of um we we each have our own um you know different spaces but we also i think have a joint space that we've it actually we actually started from Nevraham, I would say. We started, Michael was teaching Torah. Um, and that was also sort of a reaction to the political environment. We wanted to just gather and, and you know, have a space to um, connect our values and Torah as, as just a group of people, not, not so much as an activism. It was like more of an inward, you know, search for us. Um, also, I'll say personally that up until very recently, I didn't feel compelled to enmesh my political opinions and my religious beliefs. I felt like, okay, I have my Haredi background and my religious beliefs, and I'm also a feminist, and I'm also, um, you know, peace activist, and I'm also all these other things. And um, even though sometimes, obviously, these things clash, and I have some really nice explanations for how you can be a Haredi feminist and all these things, um, but I didn't feel like it was top of my list to sort of um, to create this, to you know, synchronize it. But um, I think the past year, maybe a little more, have um, have taught me that it's not just for myself because I can be me and I'm okay with me but there there are other people who are looking for for answers I think that's also what um brought the big turnout to the conference like people were just they thought we had the answers you know so they came and and um so you know laughing it off or just saying well whatever I'll work it out for myself and everybody can figure it out or here's a nice academic response or all that. Um, it's not enough anymore because um, it's very clear that this government is a big part of what I don't um, what I don't feel comfortable with or what the Smola Muni doesn't feel comfortable with is, it, is driven by religious aspects. And so we have to give a religious response to that. Thank you. Um, I think that you have inspired everybody on this call to jump in um, if they already weren't on board with the movement. Um, Michael, please. Sure. I, I mean, so last time we spoke about how the conference came about, and it, it is worth saying we've got, we have a, an event happening tomorrow. It's tomorrow, right, Pina? Uh, we, we're screening... Yes. Uh, we're screening the movie uh, Hevron H2 uh, in the Jerusalem Cinema Tech. These are obviously Israeli events, and 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 that too. We um, we opened it up uh, to the WhatsApp group, and within within three hours, there were, all the seats were sold out. And next week, we have uh, um, a yard site for um, an actress who a lot of us very much admired, um, uh, named Ronita Al Kabet, who was a who was a feminist Mizrahi Mithurti activist actress uh, who passed away seven years ago. Uh, and we're having an event um, in her uh, memory uh, in Tel Aviv in a, in a synagogue, which is currently a defunct uh, synagogue of, um, of uh, Damascus Jews. Uh, and we have a lot of events planned out um, in this upcoming Jerusalem Day, which is a day that primarily religious Zionists um, celebrate in their um, maybe very aggressive way uh, on the uh, unification of Jerusalem. So we are very uh, focused on sort of how we're going about doing things, but I think uh, we talked about this last time. I think for us, a lot of this, and, and, and Penina mentioned this before, a lot of this is also about what is a Torah that we're producing and how do we look for uh, both inspiration and and various types of rabbis from our traditions in Israel, um, which maybe have been sort of uh, marginalized, I mean, or or have always been marginal, <laughs> but have been marginalized in, um, 
in recent years who or 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 more than that um which we're more um excited about so as we're doing this all this work um on 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 uh, on a more public angle, I think a lot of the conversation, which is interesting for us to have as activists, is to talk about um, uh, the re the religious aspects and the Torah aspect. And it is worth, you know, uh, I'm sure everybody on this uh, call knows that sort of Jewish, the Jewish world in Israel and the Jewish world in the U.S. is structured uh, differently, and a, a lot and our world in, in the Smola Muni, not, not, by, not on purpose, is very much structured from people who come from various different types of, I guess, what would be called in the US Orthodox backgrounds, meaning some of us come from ultra-Orthodox worlds, and some of us come from religious Zionist worlds, and some of us come from something called the Masorti world, which in Israel means something different, I think, than in the US. It's mainly um, uh, traditional Jews from Middle Eastern origin. Uh, but are all, who also um, describe to you at least the the structure as an orthodox structure, and um, sometimes that's perceived as a challenge uh, when discussing uh, issues of equality and uh, and peace. But um, we also think there's an immense opportunity there, and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of um, um, rabbis and thought leaders who we very much admire from previous generations who we're also trying to bring back into uh, the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a follow-up question that we that um, we have is is you just spoke of the challenge of actually confronting different Torahs. Everyone has their own Torah, and coming together with um, with a sense of honor to everybody's Torah, even if it might di be diametrically opposed to your own, um, and so in some cases be quite hurtful um, when someone is using their Torah to um, what we spoke about last webinar was, um, you know, promote violence, or they interpret it as promoting violence rather than promoting something like peace and understanding. Um, what are the various responses that small emuni um, can have to those moments uh, when Torah, uh, I don't know, tor like different Torahs kind of collide? Um, do you sit with that discomfort um, or um, is there an immediate reaction of trying to find a sense of resolution? Um, and uh, I would love to hear from both of you based on both of your expertises as well. Sure. I mean, so at least, I mean, Pina and I, I mean, we just came out of a meeting discussing this. We, we, um, we very much, uh, I mean, you know, the small Muni has been around for like two, a couple of months, um, yes. but we've been, <laughs> but we've been, uh, but we <laughs> have been, at, we have been um, uh, affiliated with pro equality positions and activists in these fields and engaged in religious communities for pretty much all of our lives in various different aspects. And, you know, we educate our children in uh, religious institutions, which are uh, sometimes um, very aggressive um, towards, um, towards minorities, um, on, you know, towards Palestinians, um, um, challenging opinions on gender and so on. Um, and we operate in those spaces and maybe more uh, uh, maybe more challenging. We also very much love a lot of elements of those spaces. And it's not, this isn't an outward movement, but rather a movement from within. Um, I always, um, uh, I, like I like to give the example, like, you know, I've, I, I've, I've been an activist in Chabron for many times. So I've had, I've had physical sort of altercations with, you know, people from, with the settler community in Chabron. But if it was mincha and they would need and they would start, you know, pray and they would need me for a minion, I would join. And I think that's something that's a very hard to explain to somebody from outside of that community, from outside of our community. But it, but we're we we choose to operate within our community, and I think that choice even makes us sort of more interested in our community. So that's maybe this I don't know sociological aspect, but one of the religious aspects. The second thing that's important for me to say is that I think there's a lot in our sort of uh, halachic, I don't know how to call it, traditionalist um, tradition, which is which is positive. We always focus on a lot of the negative, uh, and there's a lot of negative 
um, in, in every tradition, in our tradition as well. But there's also a lot of positive. There's a lot of skepticism towards force. There's a lot of um, a, a lot of look towards empathy. There's a lot of um, 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 interest in the poor, in being the poor, um, and um, and this is um, and uh, and 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 as I was already as I was being asked on the chat about specifics, I can give a whole bunch of specifics. <laughs> um, I don't want to start with the with the land and covenant for the Jews because, frankly, I think that's much more of a secular Zionist issue than a religious. Uh, you know, a lot of things get pinned down on religion, but the idea of return to the land and creating a covenant with it after two thousand years is was actually a secular concept, and it is worth remembering and reminding ourselves that the Zionist project is a project which was. In, in large part constructed as an anti-religious project or an anti-God project uh, and, and you know, very upfront um, and, and created a bond, I wouldn't say a bond between the land and people, which is a, which is a bond which always existed, but a, band, a, a bond between sovereignty um, and ownership uh, and the land, which is, and, and the, the concept of ownership uh, and and sovereignty are are two modern secular Western constructs, and we tend to pin those down on religion, and religious Zionists pin them down on religion. But it's not; it's it, those are modern concepts. Those aren't religious concepts. That being said, um, our my relationship with with the land is very strong. First, in the sense that I have a lot of history there um, um, here. Um, that it, it mandates for me various various different religious, um, you know, mandates such as you know not working it every seven years and and so on. And there is a spiritual significance, but it's not a, the, the the relationship between spirituality and ownership is not necessarily a religious concept. But that's that's on the issue of covenant and land. But more important for me. To add into this construct is, is also the issue of, of, of sort of challenges of, um, of consumerism and capitalism and neo-capitalism and 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 on the other hand, uh, w which are which are you know strong in our world, but you know our our faith our our, our the, the relationship of our faith between um, not only the poor but also um, but also the immigrant. Which I think is is very strong, definitely in a, definitely language of like Musar literature in the Middle Ages, and things which are interesting to us to expand on. So that's type the type of the more specifics that I'm discussing, uh, but also more specifics would be um, reminding ourselves that we're actually very important rabbis in the 20th century. Some of which also even belong to the periphery of the Zionist movement, um, you know, like Rabbi Binyamin. Or uh, the Admora Chalutz, who we were just talking about earlier today, Pnina and I, um, or or various uh, various um, um, thinkers who were thinking about what does it mean to be part of a sovereign world, and what are the threats that are connected to that, and that is a type of Torah that we're interested in talking about more. Um, I'm throwing out sort of words out there in the air, but. Um, but I think a lot of that is is what we're focused on. Yeah, Nina. <laughs> yeah, so I'm um, I'm gonna give a little bit of um, a Haredi perspective. Um, I'm not gonna go into the whole you know theology. Um, in fact, what I'd like to say about um, Haredim and their um, interaction with uh, Zionism is that they don't have really they don't really have a theology we don't really have a theology about it meaning there is a group um that's anti-zionist okay and that is that's a group that's not politically represented it's a Haredi minority even though they're um very overrepresented in media so everybody knows the Jews from Masharim and the, that that group they're a very small group um but when when the state was founded and was when Zionism was um, you know gaining traction, they they weren't such a small group um, in inside the Haredi community. They were um, maybe of equal size to the what we call the mainstream Haredi Judaism today. But um, what we consider to be mainstream or the majority of Haredi Judaism doesn't have a very specific theology. 
about Zionism and has a theology that is um it's it's not a theology, it's a stance, it's a religious stance that um is ambivalent or oppositional to Zionism on the grounds that it's a secular project. So that's where that sort of ambivalence comes in. But there isn't like this whole, you know, you have this group that's anti-Zionist, and then you have the Haredim somewhere in the middle, and they're, you know, pretty much, you know, go with the flow. And then you have the religious Zionists who have also have a theology regarding Zionism. And but their theology is positive. They think that, you know, um Zionism is a positive. Uh, religious development, and that that's, I mean, I'm, this is very watered down and simplified, but I'm just saying this because Haredim today, uh, Israeli Haredim, I'm a first generation Israeli, so my mother came, um, as you could probably tell, my parents are from the States, um, so my father followed my mother, meaning he got stuck here because my mother was a Zionist, but my mother, my mother's from a Haredi family, I don't come from like um, you know, ballet to ballet, people who have returned, or it's, you, you know, back in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. One side is rabbinic, bakers, whatever. Everyone was Haredi, whether they were Hasidic or different types. But I, I come from a long line of, of Haredim, and um, the Lithuanian Haredim were, were quite Zionist. And um, my mother absorbed that, and she finished college and she came to Israel. And so I did absorb a lot of Zionism and and um, you know positive vibes, okay, positive vibes towards Zionism, and um, but I'll give an example. My daughter, my daughter Adi, she's turning nineteen soon. Her birthday is on Jerusalem Day. She was born on Yom Yerushalayim, and she told the teacher in school um, one time. She said, "You know, I, my birthday is on a special day," and the teacher said, "It's not a special day." And that's um, a little bit of like the Haredi attitude in a nutshell. She didn't say it's a bad day. She just said it's not a special day, okay? Um, whereas in a religious Zionist school, that would be like cause for celebration. You're so lucky. You were born on such a very special day, right? So you have this, um, you you do have, you know, people are patriotic, but their religion, again, is not enmeshed with their patriotic patrioticism is that a word or um meaning they can be patriots israeli patriots they love israel they feel very proud of israel's accomplishments um etc but they don't feel like that's part of their religious practice or thought or feelings um however having said all that um one of the things i think that propelled me into um social activism is the fact that Haredi society is changing in that way. It's losing its, um, how do you say, like in, in Hebrew, we call it galutiyut, like this feeling of being in a diaspora where you're a minority, this this idea of, you know, treading softly. And um, they're starting to feel more part of the majority. And the majority in Israel in general has gone very right. And obviously, um, also the the group that they feel most affinity to, or you know, sort of comfortable with, um, despite many big differences and arguments and all that, is still the national religious group. But when you you know, it's not going to be the secular group that's the closest. So you have both technically and ideologically this sort of uh, moving closer together, and it's when i when i first wrote about it i didn't even have data cuz nobody surveys haredi no nobody polls haredim for their political opinions cuz nobody cares about their political opinions for the simple reason that they vote for um haredi parties who are considered centrist who will you know pretty much go want to be in any government even though they haven't sat in a what's considered a left wing government in many years but um, it wasn't considered interesting. So I didn't have data. I, I sort of, um, I found this guy who was doing his uh, thesis and I took um, materials from him. But then later on, like a year later, both uh, Pew Institute and the Israel Democracy Institute did a survey. And uh, it turns out his numbers were pretty, pretty good. And I mean, they were good as in that they were correct, not they that they were um, encouraging 
Um, and they showed that, yes, the young, young Haredi um, people are moving right, they're being radicalized, they're becoming very, very nationalist, um, and, and they're adopting views that, that are not, um, not really part and parcel of, of Haredi thought as we know it until, I don't know, 30 years ago, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> um, we always wonder when we talk with each other, Panina and I uh, and others, uh, how much of this type of conversation translates to a U.S. even engaged Jewish audience, because while um, I, I think there are, there are a lot of sort of, um, what would be the word? There are a lot of assumptions about different communities. Uh, we realize that sort of, um, um, you know, reform conservative communities are much stronger in the U.S. than they, than they ever have been in Israel. And um, and um, uh, in uh, on the Israeli side, uh, th things have uh, developed differently in terms of Jewish language. And there's always this, uh, I think, assumption that that orthodoxy for for people who are coming from a faith based perspective, orthodoxy is sort of a challenge that we need to um, compromise with, meaning where we need to compromise our our orthodoxy or our religion with our values, as let's say, as opposed to a more as opposed to a more progressive denomination, uh, who who their values are aligned with their with their religious beliefs, and 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 I, and I think that's part of what makes this conversation. Uh, sometimes a bit more tricky. So even regarding the question um, that's raised now about Satmer, about whether Satmer, Satmer vote, and Satmer don't vote in the elections, but Satmer is one brand of many, many brands. And Panina mentioned the, the groups, um, the ultra-Orthodox groups who don't vote in the Israeli, Israeli elections, but you know, uh, Satmer is one of many groups of ultra-Orthodox Jews. But more importantly for me, who's somebody who cares about um, equality in general, you know, ultra Orthodox Jews. Um, um, I care about them in this country first and foremost because they're human beings who live in our country. Uh, so, you know, teachers' rights in ultra Orthodox schools should it, it should be an issue that everybody cares about in this country, and student rights and women's rights and and so on. So, this isn't only about sort of identifying communities which are an other and sort of painting them as a whole, but understanding that a those communities are much more complex um, theologically and socially. Uh, and B, they're also our responsibility. So just like, um, you know, just like uh, Palestinians under our uh, under occupation are our responsibility. So ultra-Orthodox uh, are our responsibility. And a lot of times I think liberal communities, both, both abroad and also in Israel, tend to say, oh, oh these communities made their choice part of it they're part of a problem or part of a demographic challenge or all these types of phrases that you'll hear um and i think for us first of all because we come from those communities we can't really say that but more importantly i think these communities are much more um um, um you know they're 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 part of the they're part of the political body which is called israel and that's something that we care about yeah Wow, thank you both. Um, do you, um, it is, it's really fascinating to move through this uh, personally as an American Jew um, and kind of look at the dichotomy of Judaism um, from, I'll just say an American um, and uh, Israeli perspective. And we are wondering too at more is, is, do you think that perhaps, um, the way in which both of you espouse the values of equality um, and this, uh, Michael, I loved how you said it, like they're all human, right? Like <laughs> I care for them because they're human, right? Um, does that come from a specific sense of Israeli socialism or um, a history or even the way in which every day um, living in Israel requires some sort of coexistence that um, perhaps American Jews are not faced with yeah. every single day in the same way. Well, well, well first, I, I will say that I think, you know, ultimately, we're all part, you know, we're, we're all demographics within a larger Israeli story. And in that larger Israeli story, like social democracy plays a, an important role because this country 
as opposed to the U.S. was built on a social demo, de, demo, a very broken social democratic platform, but but a social democratic platform nonetheless. So it wasn't social democratic for everybody. It wasn't social democratic for Palestinians. We need to be, um, you know, very critical about not only about 1967, but also about you know the 1940s and obviously 48 within it and the 1950s. But after that being said, you know there is the, the language here um uh has has um um in israel both jewish and palestinian has always um on many issues leaned left uh to some extent to some extent, extent in many ways today still um definitely on social economic issues much more than in the us so on issues like um you know on issues like welfare but also healthcare and so on um so that's part of it and within that you know there there is religious tradition in this country, which leans left. So the kibbutz Hadati movement or the religious kibbutz movement, which were a lot of the elites of the religious Zionist thinkers in the 1950s were very left on economic issues, sometimes also on dovish on, um, on um, social issues as, as well. Um, and so to others, you know, um, we, well, um, you know, uh, Ashlag, which is, you know, um, Bala Sulam, one of the, one, one of the, an important Hasidic a rabbi who operated here in the 40s and 50s was, you know, communist to the verge of anarchist in many senses. And there are these people who were always been in the periphery of Israeli thought, but always existed within the ether um, and, and who come from a, a very, um, I purposely say the word left and not liberal and progressive, but come from a very left background. And also uh, see that as part of their Zionism. And in that sense, um, um, uh, I'm again, and I'm, I'm doing this while trying to look at the questions. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Um, I, I, I do not, and um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of of our group. I don't think there's anybody who's there who Rav Cook or that brand of religious Zionism really speaks to any of us. Um, we realize it's very much dominating the religious Zionist space, um, or at least, you know, an interpretation of Rav Cook because. It's hard to really say what the Rav, what Rav Cook would, you know, Rav Cook died in the 30s, in the mm -hmm. 1930s. It's, you know, the most, you know, it, it wasn't a time where, where we could even imagine an army in Israel. So it's hard, but, but, but even if we, if we see his mainstream followers as, as his followers, I don't think anybody from our group is really um, keen on, on being part of that of understanding of the country, definitely in terms of the redemptive process. And regarding the, our dialogue with Palestinians, both Pina and I are active in a group in Hebron called Children of Abraham. Um, um, it's not about dialogue with Palestinians. Um, it's about ending the occupation with Palestinians. We're not, um, we don't think the issue between, and this also it, it gets back to the left-right question and power question. We don't think the issue between us and Palestinians is less of an, is is um is lack of understanding, but rather um, an imbalance of power in which they have less power than any human being um, should, and we have more and and in the case of this conversation more than what we think God wants of us. Um, so, um, in terms of dialogue. That's the type of dialogue that exists. It's one based on solidarity and mainly mutual action against uh, wrongdoings, uh, primarily in Hebron, but um, but in Jerusalem during this upcoming. We say Jerusalem Day like it's a thing. I don't know if people know on this call, but um, mm -hmm. it's going to happen in mid-May, and uh, and there will be some uh, solidarity work in Jerusalem as well. But that's the type of work uh, that we're doing. Um, there were settlers also who came uh, from. Uh, there were settlers who came from who who were in our conference as well. I saw there was a question about settlers of that, and we have uh, the communist anarchist rabbi is Rabbi Shlag Bala Sulam, student rabbi of rabbi. I think of um, the people who taught Madonna Kabbalah, but, um, translated the Zohar to Hebrew, which is what we know him for. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to answer the questions as we go. Um, yeah, I don't know if Penina have any thoughts on that. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to say, you know, Haredi, uh, Judaism is definitely sometimes very, very challenging, um, on equality, especially when you're a woman. Um, and 
but but there is an aspect of um, being Haredi that's very non-consumerist, um, and um, I'm not talking about poverty now. I'm talking about as non-consumerism as an ideal. Like you don't need to accumulate more than you need. Um, obviously, not everyone lives up to this ideal, including myself. I'm sure I have too many clothes. That's why I have a mess in my room. But um, but overall, there's this feeling of like, you need what you need. You don't have to like um, be showy and you don't have to have things that are not necessary to, you know, for living. And um, so that's something, and, and you see it also um, in Haredi communities, people are not, like the most important people are people who are learned. Now you might say they're not academically learned, but they're learned within Jewish texts and the, meaning older people who have accumulated knowledge have more um, influence sometimes than people who have a lot of money. There's sort of this like um, the the center of the community is is not around. It's not centered around um, accumulating wealth. So that's I think something that actually f is very easily um, you know fits into the narrative. And you see. Haredi communities are not organized by social economic status, meaning you can have neighbors in a Haredi um, neighborhood or city or community that one will be like, you know, dirt poor and the other one is very wealthy and they can live across the hall from each other. We don't have like segregated communities for what, I mean, maybe you have a few Haredi who have villas somewhere, but in general, um, wealthy people, poor people, middle class people all live in the same area, sent to the same schools. So um, social class in that way is not it doesn't differentiate you like just be, if you're, you know, so that's that's something that I think um, plays into socialist ideals very easily. Other things don't. Um, I, I, I think. I, I always like um asked this and I always asked myself like what possessed me um to to become this person who has unusual ideas in my community. And I know I know it's driven by equality and human dignity. Like those are the two things that really um like they bother me, you know. Other things that are are, are less those things like I feel them in 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 you know in in myself like I feel very strongly and it's it's not even like an you know an intellectual exercise I remember walking to the Kotel the western wall on Shavuot which is like this um sort of new tradition that started in in 67 when the you know when we captured or um however you want to call it when we when we regained access to the western wall for prayer and it was very near to the holiday of Shavuot. And so it became a tradition. And um, it's actually a tradition. It's interesting because it's a tradition that um, all different types of people from Jerusalem have, like it, it, any any level of religiosity, a lot of people will, will do this. And obviously teenagers, it's fun. Your parents let you walk in the middle of the night. So we all used to do it. And, um, and we walked through the Arab market. Um, and I, I, I was young, I was maybe 14 and I noticed that their living conditions were far, far, you know, beneath ours. And I didn't come from a wealthy neighborhood. I came from a Haredi neighborhood, which, you know, um, and it, you know, in the eighties and nineties, it was nothing exciting. You know, it's like these big block buildings with apartments and, um, speaking of consumerism, like for me to get a Walkman from America was like a very exciting present. So we weren't like wealthy, you know, I had, I, I got a bike for my birthday. So, and you see these kids at the time and the, the disparity I think was even bigger, like really the, the way you, you imagine, you know, inner city Cairo or Mumbai, like barefoot with eye diseases, like things that you don't see, um, even in poor Western spaces. And I came home and, and I said something to my parents. This is before I had any political awareness. And I said, you know, those, those people are very poor, like these Arabs, like it's not okay that they're so poor. And they live 20 minutes away. How can that be? 
And my mother's response, and my mother's a kind, um, forward-thinking woman. She said to me, well, they didn't have it any better under the Jordanians. And I sort of felt like that wasn't a good enough answer, but I didn't, you know, the, these things kept occurring um, throughout the years. Maybe other people wouldn't have noticed it, um, wouldn't have processed it the same way as I did. I don't know. It's like an interaction of your environment. You can live an entire life in Jerusalem and not go to East Jerusalem and not meet Palestinians and not interact with them and not know um, even that they're not citizens or that they have different, you know, lesser rights or what they're, you can do that. There, there are many, many, both secular and religious Israelis who live in Jerusalem their entire life, born and bred, or came here as students and set up their families and homes here. They have no idea. And I think that that's something also that that's a little bit different than the Haredi community. It's not even always, a, I was talking to Michal. I don't know if you met Michal yet, but... Um, so we were discussing like why our parents think this way and that, you know, like how, how the political environment impacted us and our parents' generation in different ways. Um, and, and I said to her, you know, it's not just um, a matter of in Hebrew. So I said, it's not just um, opinions or it's, it's knowledge. Like my parents live in Jerusalem. They, they're Haredi. They don't visit the West Bank. The only time they step anywhere that's um, sort of Palestinian territory is when they go to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, to pray like twice a year. Other than that, they I don't think they've ever made, when have they gone through a checkpoint? They don't go through checkpoints. My brother didn't go to the army. My father didn't go to the army. So they don't even interact. Like they have, they just hear what's on the news. And then now, because um, mainstream Israeli media has become more right wing, especially when you're talking about this specific issue. So Haredi media has also become more right wing. My parents also read the Jerusalem Post. When I was a child, we got Newsweek or Time magazine. Um, but the Jerusalem Post has also moved. Right. Like, at, so they're just absorbing pretty much regular Israeli media. Um, and that's that's the result. Like, mo and most people, most Israelis, um, regardless of religious affiliation, I think, are in that situation. Except the, um, I think that the national religious group has the most interaction with Palestinians. They actually bring it up sometimes to like to show that they're more inclusive, <laughs> as opposed to saying, you know, we're the ones who are the problem. No, we're very inclusive. We know our Palestinian neighbors and we employ them and all of that kind of um, rhetoric. So, um, so yeah, so part of the issue is just like actually the facts on how they're presented. Mikhail, do you wanna say something? Thank you, Vanina. Sure, um, I'll just say that um, uh, we've been focusing uh, in this call, um, um, on uh, on the on the specific Israeli sort of elements of of how you know politics develop and how religion develops, um, but as Penina mentioned before, uh, her and also me, we have we have American backgrounds, and I think a lot of that, or at least partial, and I think some of that plays in um, as well. I mean, other than sort of the larger sociological issues, we're both sort of products of our own environment. Um, and uh, and that's where I think you know the, the 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 relationship is not only demographic sort of you know who are the who are your orthodox counterparts or who are your you know um, your orthodox affiliations or your conservative affiliations or your reform affiliations but rather how sort of your communities develop and how your families develop um, you know my my father comes from a uh, from a conservative background uh, in Baltimore uh, and my mom comes from an ultra orthodox community in Nebrak. And I think a lot of how those communities develop and a lot of how the language that, you know, I grew up developed has a lot to do with their upbringing as well. So a lot of times we look at these communities as if they're completely separate and they're on their own trajectory. But if you take two generations back or three generations back, things actually get um, much more uh, complicated 
And I think in there, there also lies sort of um, an ability to create a relationship um, across, um, you know, across um, uh, across the Atlantic or across any other places in, in the world and, and in the Jewish world in particular. That, and that relationship is also based on sort of our understanding of history and also our understanding of text. Uh, you know, um, Tina was mentioning classes, which we learned together, different texts. And these texts are, you know, usually texts that were written in the 16th century or 12th century or 18th century. And they're very inspiring to us because they focus on ethics of, um, of I would say, extreme empathy. Um, and um, and a, as a part of desire, to, desire for piety and holiness. Um, but those texts, you know, affected American Jewry as they affected Israeli Jew Jewry in different ways. And I think looking back to those points and how our traditions developed um, are very, is very important. So, and on my own, you know, personal narrative, the fact that my father grew up in, in you know, in one area and my mother um, uh, grew up in another area, I, I've, you know, the Torah that I was taught is pretty similar from both sides, even though they came from various different backgrounds. And I think that has a lot to do with just how they were, you know, how they were raised and, and what were the values that, that were upheld there. And I think what we're trying to do um, in the faithful left is really is is really point back to those to those values and see where we can um, get inspired by them and they they come from all over the world and they come from you know from very various, various different parts of history so it's important for me to say that a because I just saw my uncle here on the on the call <laughs> from Baltimore would <laughs> be um, and more importantly um, I don't know if more importantly because because very quickly this can become a very hyper-specific Israeli issue. And we've been talking about that because that's where this is taking place. But, you know, I think American, uh, you know, American Jews need to reconcile with their power as Israeli Jews need to reconcile with their power. And these conversations, I think, are, are equally important. Definitely when we talk about issues of, um, of class um, and... Um, 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 and not only of issues of, um, you know, of violence. I mean, issues of violence as well. We're we're both citizens of countries which have um, a lot to prove uh, on issues of violence. Um, yeah, uh, books. Sorry, before I forget, the books that we study as as a is a is a is a genre of literature um, uh, called um, uh, ethical lit. Eth uh, ethics is a bad translation of Musar, but we'll just say it anyway. It's called uh, ethical literature. Piety, I like better. Uh, but there, it's usually translated to ethics, and it would be Tomer Dvora um, by, by Cordovero or Rishi Chochma, Sefer Hasidim. Even, um, yeah, uh, I would say, I would say just the whole, um, in the, the whole spirit of ethical literature, uh, which have been quite a, quite a lot, primarily in the Middle Ages, but from all over the Jewish world, you know, R Rambam's son named Avram, the son of the Rambam, wrote a, an important book, uh, Sufi inspired and um, duty duty of the heart by Abba bin Pakuda. There are a whole bunch. Um, they're very very um, uh, can be very motivating and inspiring. Can also be very scary and inspiring of OCD, but um, but are important nonetheless um, for us. Uh, those books and others. Um, hope that, oh, to write that in the chat, I can write it to me. If there are other people speaking, I can say the name of those books. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I just want to get to some of the questions that are being sent to me, um, which also jump off of um, what you were both speaking about just now in terms of um, making sure that we understand the intersectionality of identity as it crosses the Atlantic um, when it comes to the, the places we come from and then the places we end up. Um, and one question that we have received numerous times um, is how can we as North American Jews be most helpful as allies? Um, what can we do? And um, what do you need from us? especially as um, there is a holding and lifting of so many different values. Um, does that ever, um, does, 
Well, my question is, does that ever get confusing as we do honor everyone's a multitude of values? Um, but also, um, in, in what ways can we support you? Um, well, as we're right, we're very much still in, at least in this sort of iteration of our activism, we're really in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard for us to give. We're just happy we, we have an opportunity to talk about the things which are interesting to us on this call and, uh, and, and even listening to the types of questions that we're listening and seeing what interests you guys is really important. Um, I said this on the last call as well, but I think, um, you know, when when Trua does and Trua does do so much um, um, uh, important work on how uh, how you guys you know strengthen um, um, the values and 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 you know values and virtues which which are important for us as well. I think that um, um, I think that's important. We had a mail go out a couple of weeks ago about um, resisting uh, resisting tyrants and uh, which want to call back to one of your uh, one of your um uh very good um um slogans so i think i you know it, ultimately i think all of us as engaged you know actors and sort of jewish spheres are interested in seeing what what's happened there it is <laughs> mm -hmm. our our folks our folks who, who who didn't know that from before got such a kick out of that slogan um but i think you know more than that it's just um it's just recognizing recognizing that that there are really interesting uh, things being done um, in the Jewish world. Ultimately, you know, everybody's dealing with a lot of, you know, definitely people who, who care about um, equality. We're all dealing with the same issue, which is different name. Um, so it's, it, I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about what we need um, um, more than what somebody else needs, A, because I don't think at this point really need anything specific, but also because, um, that conversation already creates a certain dynamic between uh, between what should be um, you know friends and learning partners and um, and that's and that that that's a two way street. Um, it's also important for us to understand what you need, um, um, and uh, and also just to just to see what you guys are doing and uh, and hear about it over here and see the questions and you know I. Um, I, uh, I I love um, that in the chat I get to write name of uh, names of books from the Middle Ages. I mean that that for me is what I need. I need to write names of books and on chat rooms and for the written Middle Ages. Um, my dad's son. Um, uh, and re regarding uh, the crossover between liberal denominations and Orthodox non-Orthodox divide, yeah, we're we're fine with any collaborations. Uh, we're where we, we, as you can um, um, imagine from both of our bios from different from different directions, we've um, pretty much made the choice at some point to basically do what we want. Um, so we're fine with we're 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 happy to be you know we're happy to be every, everywhere. There's a serious conversation. I'll get back to writing these books when Nina, you can continue, and I'll. <laughs> um, I just want to say that um, just a thought in my head right now is that um, something that that has occupies me sometimes is um, I feel like, um, you know, religious stands for sort of improving yourself and being a better person in the world and making the world a better place. And I think the hardest clash for me is when I see something that's coming from a religious place, but it's actually creating the opposite of um, you know, improvement and bringing more light and, and goodness into the world. And sometimes it can be like, I mean, obviously we can talk about it in the context of occupation, but it can be across many spectrums. It can be on the LGBTQ spectrum. It can be on the, you know, um, gender gap spectrum. It can be in, in all kinds of ways, poverty versus like, there's so many ways in which Sometimes religion can um, play, you know, a role in actually exacerbating a problem. And that's where um, I feel like if there are people that want to be, you know, they 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 don't, I'm not going to convince people who think they're right and they're doing the right thing and that they're, they're doing things to improve the world, which I think are terrible. 
But I want to be able for people who um, have that gut feeling that I have when they when they're faced with these issues, like to have the language um, and to have the option of saying yes, but there's also that I, I can say it that way. I can look at it that way. Um, my religion doesn't compel me to, um, you know, be a, be detrimental to other people, be detrimental to my environment, be detrimental to my you know, neighbors, whatever it is. So I think that's for me, like at the core, go, I'm like going back to your first question of what compelled me to come to this mode. Muni. I think that's like at the core of it. It's providing a, a, another option um, for people who have the inclination already to have religious language and to have conversations that um, allow them to feel comfortable both in their religious beliefs and in their own skin, but at the same time, um, you know, to to have the the language, the Torah language to, that they can use to, to um, you know, to explain that to themselves and the world or whatever. Thank you. Um... I would venture to say that creating that other option for a lot of people just means creating hope, which is uh, what your movement is doing. Um, and last time we spoke about the opposite of loneliness, having that loneliness. Um, so we want to thank you for teaching us more about the option of hope and the option of the opposite of, of loneliness uh, as we face these issues in this world. Um, in closing, all of us at Amor and Trua would like to thank Panina and Mikhail for sharing your expertise with us and allowing us to be a part um, of this movement through witness and by learning more about it. We look forward to seeing you and your co-organizers back here in June for part three of this series. Um, we'll email out those details as soon as we've confirmed them. Um, as you'll see in an upcoming slide that we have here, two other events coming up that I would love to uh, flag for you. Um, one is that, well, our first issue of Fragments and Moore's twice a year publication is still available for download on our website. Um, and our call for submissions and pitches for our second issue, centering on Israel, democracy, race, ethnicity, and more, is now live. So you can find this all on our website. Please, we would love to see what you have to add to our discussion and to our Fragments publication. Also, we are so excited to announce that our Trua Gala is coming up on May 10th. You can find information about supporting our honorees um, at trua.org backslash gala 2023. Stay tuned for the next webinar in this series. We would like to thank um, everyone on the Trua and Amor staff who made today's program possible. Max Antman, Shira Danan, Bennett Decker, Rabbi, Bill, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, and Rachel Lerner. The music you heard as we started the program was Darkinu by Danny Bassan. Um, and again, we want to thank you so much, Panina and Mikhail, for the work that you're doing and for sharing that with us this afternoon or this night. Um, and just uh, major kola kavod uh, for your brains working this late at night, um, which is a big ask for most people. Thank you, and we um, wish you a wonderful day, and we thank all of us for being members of our community at Amor, where we believe words create worlds. Bye.